recording this. There we go, recording now. Okay, so I guess um, there was a few no responses, but I'm going to show the responses now. Okay, so um, quite a few of you think the court accounting is going to be, you know, at least so so too too hard. Okay, and I remember when I was in my undergrad taking my first financial accounting course, I thought the exact same thing. Okay. Um, and there was an aha moment that I had, but it, it took a while for me to get there. Now, one of the great things about you good people uh, coming into the program is that you've, you've already taken um, some level of uh, cost control class, correct? Can you let me in, know in the chat if you've taken uh, some form of cost control class, either with this college, another university, uh, another college. Yeah, most of you, you're in the bridge, so most would. Yeah, food, Bev. Yeah. Took the cost control. Yes, yes. So most of us have. Okay. Um, and I know the cost control class fairly well. Um, uh, I lead it for George Brown College. Now, I want in the chat, tell me something that you did really well in cost controls. What's a, por what's a portion of that course that you were just like, that I did this, uh, I did an amazing job on this. Calculations, very good. What else? Formatting Excel spreadsheets, calculating and standing the sheets, using Excel to do math for me, absolutely. What else? Excel is fun, it is fun for me too, actually. <laughs> At first it was terrifying and then you figure out how to use it and you're like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever used. Yeah, okay, so in this course, we do build, um, can't wait to learn more in depth, and absolutely, the, the cost controls class that you took is really the stepping stone for this course. A lot of the definitions, a lot of the things that you've done in cost controls you're going to continue with this course and a lot of the things that you did well in cost controls you're going to do well in this course as well because vanessa messenger that um she did the calculations well there are going to be some calculations in this course right formatting of excel spreadsheets we're going to use excel in this course too understanding calculating and understanding yes we're going to be interpreting financial statements again in this course um, and again, a lot of comments around Excel, where then you should find, while some of you said, uh, most of you said this is either going to be so-so or it's going to be hard, you already have a lot of strengths in accounting. So I don't want you to be intimidated by this course, A, uh, uh, because I think um, we take a really practical approach to it, and we'll talk more about the course in just a bit. Um, but also, you have a lot of strengths in accounting already. Uh, Vanessa would like to learn more about the financial statement sheets. Uh, that's what you had the most challenge with. Yes, absolutely. We're going to show you a step-by-step -step way to produce an income statement and a balance sheet. And as some and like, some, while this could be intimidating at first, we're going to show you how to do that step-by-step. Accounting is very if, this, then, that. So once we know one piece of information and we uh, understand some of the rules, um, we'll understand how to, where to put things and, um, and how to go through this process. Because that's what it is. It's just steps and check marks. And it's, a, it's a list of steps. And if you know the steps and you have the information to complete the steps, then you're golden. Right. So that's the way we've designed. I've designed the course is this course is going to take us step by step through the accounting process. And we're going to practice it all the way along. OK, you're going to find that your assessments in the course, which, again, we'll talk about a little bit later, mimic very similarly what we're going to practice on a weekly basis. OK, so uh, in terms of uh, in, in this being intimidating, um, I think you'll find it that it's quite practical and um, that you, this is going to be very rewarding for you. OK, or at least I hope you find it that way. <laughs> uh, when I was in my undergrad, I did not find it terribly rewarding at first, 
but uh, it wasn't my strength back then. It is now. Uh, would you mind uh, explaining the differences between this course and the managerial accounting? Absolutely. Um, in this course, okay, this kind of touches on what we're going to talk about in the class, but it's good to bring it up uh, at first. Um, there are two main users of accounting information. There are people outside of a business or organization that use a business's accounting information. And then there are people within the business or organization that use the, the business's accounting information. The difference between this course and managerial accounting is that perspective difference. This course focuses on external users of information, of accounting information, and the decisions that they would typically have to engage in with it. Whereas managerial accounting, we take the perspective of a food service manager or a um, an internal user of um, accounting information to make business oriented decisions, right? Um, if you, an example of the difference of decisions that can be made from either internal or external users information, a lot of external users of information say, hey, this is what their financial information is. The decision that I can make with this is, should I invest or not, right? In fact, that's the question you're, I'm going to give, I'm going to give you your final exam question right now. You're going to be asked whether you would invest in a business or not based on a particular set of information. Whereas in managerial accounting, you'd be asked more questions like, how do I make this more efficient? Or how can I make my um, business more liquid? Or how can I, should I buy this new piece of equipment? Should I stay open an, an hour later? Right. And those decisions are based on um, the business itself. Yeah, absolutely. Me, too. Um, this uh, is it. Well, I, I enjoy teaching all of the accounting classes, but this is particularly one of my favorite um, be, because it's um, it's so practical. And um, I don't know. I just I just like accounting, I guess. So let's continue here. Actually, wait, before I before I continue. Uh, does anybody have any questions that I can help answer? Or put a thumbs up in the chat if you're if you're good to go. Oh good, we got some thumbs up. Really awesome. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly do 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 do. I'm confused there. Okay, so let's continue. So today's objectives. Okay, they're in no particular order, unfortunately. Um, we are going to discuss the relevance of accounting principles to to the food service operator. Okay, and to others uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself. And maybe we can do some uh, some quick introductions in the chat. Um, I'm not expecting anybody to use their camera. Okay. In fact, I'd like to keep all comments in the chat. Okay. That way, I can um, uh, I can I can speak to them right away. Um, also, the bandwidth. <laughs> I'm having a good internet day today. <laughs> um, but also because I can download the chat and refer to your points um, at a later time. So please uh, keep all comments to the chat itself, okay? Uh, we're gonna introduce me. We'll do some um, some quick introductions uh, of yourself. Um, we're gonna introduce the course, so your learning objectives, the course topical, uh, the, the class format, um, any of the assignments that you're gonna have. Uh, we might not do the introduction to Microsoft Excel, but we'll, we'll come back to that because you all seem to have a skill set with Microsoft Excel. And then we're going to talk a little bit about chapter one in our textbook, and I'll tell you what that text is in a second. And um, we're going to do a quick little workshop. We're not going to do it in groups because our class is small oh. enough to do it individually. So uh, we'll do an individual exercise. Okay. So a little bit about you. Okay. So in the chat, and of course, you don't necessarily need to to have an exact answer about this. So when you're done your degree, what job will you have? So in the chat, um, 
you know, obviously your names by your icon, but let us know maybe what job do you want to have when you're done your degree, right? Or if you're not, if you're sure what job you want to have, and that's totally fine because I didn't know either. Um, you know, what are you passionate about in our industry? I'll give you a couple minutes to put that in the chat. Kind of introduce yourself. Cool, some pretty cool responses. Give everyone a little bit more. <laughs> Excuse me. My throat is, is super dry from yesterday. I had, uh, I had another class yesterday and um, I'm trying to talk slowly today because I talked rather fast yesterday and loud and um, my throat got a little raspy. Okay, so some good responses. I'm just going to count them up here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I lost count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13. Yeah, I've, I've got a glass of water right by me. I usually go through like six glasses of water when I'm teaching. Okay, so we got some good responses. So if you haven't um, uh, responded yet, uh, keep going. I'm just going to start speaking to some of the, um, the comments here. So looking for opportunities. Joseph, looking for opportunities within uh, food and hospita hospitality, but outside of restaurants. Absolutely. Uh, and there are there are tons and there's examples in in the chat you know ghost kitchens um, healthcare absolutely there's food production there's food science there's there's so many opportunities this degree is so versatile to what you can do when you're done and the, you know the your comment towards the more opportunities um, that pretty much means m m more management level. Uh, um, uh, positions or roles, right? In order for you to uh, to be able to do that effectively, you've got to know accounting. So this is going to be really relevant to you. And um, and yeah, this is this is you brought up a good point uh, that the, this is going to be this is going to be boss school, right? I mean, you you do learn culinary, which is which is awesome and interesting. But the management piece to this degree is you're essentially in boss school. You're going to be somebody's boss. You're going to have to make decisions. And you need accounting uh, knowledge to do that. Ghost Kitchen Startups. Every single startup needs to use accounting information, Paul. Um, you need to be able to present a, a, a budget, an income uh, pro forma, um, a balance sheet, cash flow, um, capital expenditure, things like that. Um, uh, Dan, uh, a chef or a business owner, totally. Chefs need to be able to look at the accounting information and be able to interpret it as to whether it's good or bad. And as a business owner, you know what I mean? These accounting principles tell you whether you are doing well or not so well. Uh, but as a profession within the healthcare sector in the food service department, very cool, very cool. Yeah, and um, I was speaking to Dr. Wibbs a very long time ago when uh, this degree just started. And he said that he believed that this degree was perfect for the um, for the upcoming needs of uh, food service within uh, healthcare, because of the aging generation, um, there's going to be need. For, uh, there's going to be a, a, a tremendous need for well-educated uh, management people within the healthcare sector, specifically within food service. So this is going to be really relevant to you, I think. Then stuff. Uh, work in a work in a higher position in the bakery or a restaurant. Totally. And you need accounting knowledge to do that. You got to be able to look at a PNL and go, okay, this is good or bad, 
right? Um, Ryan would be the next Gordon Ramsay. Absolutely, because, uh, and I mean, I'm assuming Gordon Ramsay knows his accounting information. Um, be it, uh, restaurant business owner, same thing. You need accounting knowledge. Running a restaurant, totally. Farm to table concept. That's a really interesting um, uh, passion that you have, TJ. And it's, it's kind of one that's really relevant right now because I was talking to um, Dr. Oh, I can't pronounce her. Dr. Lori S. I forget her last name. I apologize, but I know it starts with an S. And um, she's developing a sustainability course. As, uh, and one of the major topics is, is farm to table. And she's the reason we were talking is we were having difficulty kind of quantifying the advantages of farm to table. Obviously, there's social uh, and environmental um, uh, implications to that. But what are the financial? Right. And um, yeah, we're kind of going through the research and, and, and uh, breaking it down right now. So um, hopefully I can share some of that content with you in this class, because one of the main reasons why people are not sustainable i mean everyone gr agrees that we should be sustainable it's like recycling everyone agrees we should recycle some business owners do not make a switch to more sustainable practices because they don't know how to measure it because they don't see the financial positives to being sustainable so i'm hoping we can talk a lot about that in our financial courses itself uh chef bistro owner totally um Love to work in marketing, creativity is strength. Ultimately, own your own bakery, a bakery, totally. Okay, so you're going to need that accounting uh, information or knowledge um, to run your bakery, right? And um, within this degree, um, you do take marketing, and marketing is going to be something that um, is going to uh, follow with you as you progress through your, your coursework. Okay, I think you've got, you've got two marketing courses. I think I could be wrong with the bridge. But uh, marketing is going to be a big topic in, in uh, concepts of customer service, which I also teach because uh, my area of expertise is within services marketing or marketing uh, services marketing or ser uh, services management. Sorry, I was talking quick again. Hydrate, totally. I'm going to take a sip. Open a restaurant, absolutely. If you were starting it um, from ground up, um, again, you're going to need to put a business plan together, and financials are a big piece of that plan. Uh, be featured on Chop someday? Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm not sure how well the, the, the accounting information is going to, or knowledge is going to help you there, but definitely a cool passion. Um, I know some of our teachers were, were judges on the Food Network. For example, oh, uh, Chef David, David Wolfman. I'm surprised that I was slow on his name there because I sat beside him. Um, uh, Chef Khan, I believe, uh, and a few others. Uh, you're currently doing a startup, and uh, uh, sorry, Justin, the previous one, restaurant owner, absolutely, you need the accounting knowledge uh, to be able to make decisions about that, um, about your, your restaurant, and if you want investors, you, you need that accounting knowledge to present your business as a good idea financially for them. You're currently doing a startup, absolutely, um, that's so cool. Um, some of my entrepreneurship students from last semester uh, have actually started, when they were going through the course, they actually started up either a small uh, catering business or uh, put together a plan to start marketing their catering business. So that's super cool. Uh, yeah, Joseph, and, and um, you felt that restaurants were the only thing that existed coming out of culinary school, so it's nice to know there's more. Absolutely. And there's a lot of opportunities. Um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities out, outside of restaurants. Um, I remember when we started teaching this course, uh, uh, sorry, started teaching uh, or started delivering this program, we were like taught everything from a restaurant perspective, right? And then all of, well, there was a student that I had in the bridge, actually. He was in, um, he was in the bridge like you. And he's like, Dave, I'm like, yeah. He's like, why are we always talking about restaurants, man? I'm like, that's a really good point. So while we do talk about restaurants, we do open it up into things like food trucks, uh, into, um, you know, catering, ghost kitchens. We talk about hotels as well, things like that. And there's also a lot of flexibility in this degree because you get to choose 
the context or the subject of which you study, right? So we're going to talk about accounting in this course. You get to choose how you apply that accounting information. So really cool there. I like they brought that up. Once we graduate, we would need to work our way up. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but um, you would, uh, because you have a BCom, um, you would be eligible to apply to management positions right away. Um, for example, any recipe, uh, and again, apologies, this is a restaurant example, but any um, any higher brand in Recipes Unlimited, which is uh, formerly Care of Foods, um, to be uh, a manager, uh, to be on a management team within those restaurants, you need a uh, you need a degree. You need a four year degree. So um, you wouldn't have to start in the in the kitchen and work your way up. You could apply right away to a management position there. Uh, BRC documentary on sustainability was great to watch. Yeah, um, yeah, and we're uh, sustainability is a huge topic, um, and it's one that is a little difficult to apply to financial courses. For example, this. Um, but we found a way, we did a lot of research and we've, we've found a way to include it in this course, managerial accounting and in finance, which is crazy. Do, 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 do. I'd like to bring more uh, plant-based foods from scratch, long care. It is uh, healthier food um, other than packaged. I think one thing that I've realized in my own personal life um, specifically after I got married to my wife, because my wife was primarily vegetarian before when she lived in India, is that, uh, you know, uh, I was going to the supermarket and I was buying food that was super cheap, but was super bad for you. Um, and then I, uh, you know, we started cooking um, more vegetarian food because that's what, you know, um, uh, that was some of her culinary tastes and she kind of exposed that to me and it's so much healthier for you a little bit more expensive but these plant-based options and plant-based alternatives are becoming the new norm and we do talk about it quite a bit in, in the program uh master chef yeah he was a master chef so done okay um your cost control semester from semester two won an episode of chopped awesome cool who would have uh who are my cost control teachers? Uh, Chef Matus, Chef Wolfman. Um, oh, it was oh, it was a her. Oh, uh, Chef Brewer, Brewster. Well, if you forget her name, I, I don't know. Um, what is it? Uh, do, 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 it's cool. Uh, for the playlist, yeah, it's personalized so we can work towards our goals. For, yeah, absolutely. And um, what is it called? The the because the program well, actually the program is pretty big right now. <laughs> it wasn't so big before, but our class sizes are are relatively uh, small, so we get to know everyone really well. And we get to know what your tastes are, and um, we're we're better able to place you in in different scenario like different placements that are more interesting to you, right? Um, um, and we can work with you a lot uh, a lot easier because there's few of you, uh, fewer of you. Um, for example, I I look at resumes uh, for placements. I'm also your I'm also the mentor for both of your externships, so your culinary externship and your management externship. So I'll be there with you um, through those two things so I can help you, um, you know, draft cover letters, draft um, introductory, e introductory oh. emails and resumes that will help you get the uh, placement that you want. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, investing more f into your health. And I think that's one of the things that um, that was really brought up during COVID-19 is the duality of if, uh, of food, right? Um, food from a critical, uh, not a critical perspective, but food is two things. It is one, A, a luxury, but if it's also a luxury, it's also a scarcity from somebody else. And that um, food is nutrition. And um, some of the uh, some of the prices that we pay for the, that nutrition is, is a bit crazy, but it is a good investment. Right? It's a very cool investment. So very cool uh, comments, very cool passions, and 
and ideas. And yeah, it sounds like you're all in the right place. You've all got the right passions, the right interests and future aspirations to be in, in this degree. Um, and that's one of the, 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 sorry, one of the things that I love about this particular program is that our students are pretty much self-selected. Uh, for example, some of the some of you students that I've had before, I know that you're you're very good students. <laughs> um, so I know that you're in the right place, a because of your comments, but also because you have actually decided to be here. So that's really awesome, and it's awesome to meet you. So let's continue here. So this is kind of what I was trying to get at with that previous uh, question of what you wanted to do is that any food service manager or food service management or operator needs to be multifunction uh, functional um, to be able to a be competitive in the job market, but also be successful in industry. OK, and one piece of that is having a very intimate knowledge of accounting practices. Right. You need to be able to look at. Um, I mean, whatever position you have, you're going to be management. This is a Bachelor uh, of Commerce. So you've got BCom, um, which means that you're going to go into management of something. It could be in uh, it could be in hotels, it could be in restaurants, it could be in healthcare. Um, whatever that is, is you're going to be the boss and you need to have this accounting uh, knowledge in order to be successful. And that's what we try and teach you with this course. So a little bit about me. Um, this picture was taken before I got COVID fat. <laughs> um, I was still pretty chubby then. Um, but I'm Dave. Oh, you know what I mean? Um, I'm not a chef. Uh, so uh, in terms of how you would address me, I'm good with Dave, guys. I'm a student too. Um, uh, we're, we're, I want to have a the kind of relationship I'd like to have with my students is one that's open, uh, honest, and, and approachable, right? So, yeah, you can call me professor. All that stuff is great. Um, but Dave is great as well, okay? Uh, I'm a theory professor, okay? So um, I'm actually a management professor. I've been so for over five years now. I, well, I've been with the college for five years now, over five years. Um, I was part time for maybe two years because I was still in industry and I was like, what should I should I be a teacher? And then I did <laughs> and I liked it. So um, I've been full time for uh, three years or so. Um, brew, uh, brewing beer, Danny. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second because it has uh, it touches on my experience a little bit. Um, in terms of what I do with the college, um, I lead uh, all of the accounting curriculum and uh, entrepreneurship curriculum. Okay, so uh, your cost controls class and your entrepreneurship class, um, uh, I lead those classes and the professors that teach them. Um, and every accounting class that you will take in this degree, I designed. There are going to be subtle differences because I'm not the only accounting teacher. Okay, so within the accounting team of this degree, it's me. Um, Dr. Nisham, Dr. Nisharina Nisham, who is awesome. Um, and then we have uh, another teacher, uh, 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 Professor Datto. And uh, I believe he's he's actually going to be teaching you managerial accounting uh, in the next seven weeks. Okay? And he's really good, too. Um, so, yeah, um, I teach primarily in the while I lead various courses at the diploma level. Um, and design most uh, some courses at the diploma level. Um, I'm I'll probably continue with you um, in the degree program because I teach primarily in the degree. Okay, so I'll probably teach finance, revenue management, or uh, customer service. Okay, I have over 12 years industry experience. I worked primarily with Gara Foods. I was never a chef, but I know how to work in the back of house. Um, I'm pretty familiar with most traditional dishes. Okay, I'm um, I'm I'm I, st I try to stay away from fusion because I don't have a good grasp um, on mixing some flavors. You know what I mean? Like I've tried before and it's been successful. But anyway, I'm, I'm sure you're a lot better at fusion than I am. But uh, so yeah, I can work in the back of house. I usually when somebody calls in sick or somebody has to leave the line, I I jump on the line <laughs> or the chef does. Um, but I worked primarily in the front of the house. So, um, hey, Paul, I worked at, uh, I worked at Milestones too. Which Milestones do you work at?
Oh, cool. The Dun Dundas. The, the Toronto Dundas or the the Miss uh the Mississauga. Yes, Toronto. Okay. Uh Dundas Square, I believe it was. Yeah. I worked um yes, I did work with milestones. Um I worked uh, I worked at every milestone or I managed every milestones from um Hamilton all the way to Brampton. So that's milestones um Burlington, Burloak, Vega Boulevard, Heartland, uh, and yeah. So uh, we might have some uh, mutual contacts, yeah. But I was primarily in the front of the house, and I was typically the bar manager uh, as well as the operations manager. I did do uh, human resources for a little bit, but um, yeah. And then I, I, I was an assistant general manager for another brand for a little bit. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed our industry. Uh, it's fast paced. Um, you get to work with a lot of uh, a really diverse group of people with um, a different strengths. And um, and because to be management in our industry, you have to be knowledgeable and not good, but you have to be able to be really flexible in what you do. For example, um, uh, for me to be a bar manager, I had to know uh, how to look at a profit and loss statement. I had to know, um, you know, who to hire as a bartender. I, I needed to know how to train. I needed to know how to cost. I needed to know how to market my bar, things like that. So food service management is very versatile and this degree is great for that. Um, to that point, um, past kegger here, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, and that's, uh, <laughs> Mary Ellen, you've brought up a very interesting thing. Um, yeah, I know Kara does now own the uh, keg, and if any of you are taking notes right now, write down that Kara bought the keg. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, star, star. You don't need to know why yet, but write down that Kara Foods bought the keg. Um, so yeah, um, and the, the a good segue there is that um, my degree really helped me be successful in industry. Okay, so I um, I have a BCom in marketing management. Um, I have an MBA in hospitality. Okay, and um, I'm 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 currently finishing my uh, my PhD in services management. So my research is in service recovery. So I'm investigating how do we make sure our customers are satisfied and loyal even if a mistake happens in a restaurant and there are so many mistakes that can happen um between cold food poor timing uh bad service things like that and my research i'm hoping is going to show us and show industry how that when these problems happen how do we approach how do we how do we recover from that situation in a manner that leaves our customers satisfied even though something bad happened and still loyal to our business because um typically speaking when something bad happens in a restaurant that like if you go to a restaurant and something bad happens um you might not uh you might not go back right so we want to guard our customer loyalty and we'll actually talk quite a bit about that in our customer service course um and then uh yeah so hopefully i uh, my research is it's it, it's based on in-person dining, and that isn't happening right now. So uh, my research is kind of put on hold, which is okay because it's a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm taking a little bit of a breather from the PhD. Um, I'm, I'm almost done though. Um, what is your favorite breweries in Toronto? Uh, your partner's a home brewer. Yeah, there was somebody else that was a home brewer. Let me see up here. Sue Young, absolutely home brewer which is a great segue. Um, one of my favorite breweries, um, I'm not terribly familiar with Toronto. I'm, uh, I've been to, uh, I've been to Steam Whistle, um, but I haven't gone around to a lot of the breweries in Toronto, mainly because I live in Burlington. Um, in Burlington, we have, a, we have one really good one. We have Nickelbrook, um, where they, um, they do a lot of um, aged beers um, in, in various different casks. All right. So when they age beer in Kentucky barrels, in um, uh, bourbon barrels, uh, things like that, which is really cool. There's also 
Um, one uh, in Hamilton I really like, but I forget what it's called. But there's tons in Hamilton. And then, yeah, I'm um, I'm a uh, I'm I'm an avid home brewer, so I haven't made anything in a while because we moved into a really small condo, <laughs> like a really small condo. And um, I just don't have room for all of my equipment, like my, my carboys, my um, my my stuff. Um, so I left it at my mom's. Um, but I'm gonna make a cider for the summer. I usually make cider um, because I actually make a really good cider, I think. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna wait till apple juice goes goes on sale because it can become kind of expensive. But yeah, other than that. Um, you're into weedy beer, wheat beers recently. Very cool. I've gotten into. I'm not a really big beer guy. I'm I'm more of a whiskey guy, but um, my beers when I drink them are typically I like ales, red ales. I like um, some stouts. I like uh, kind of things like that, like darker beers. So sad. No more beer. I know. Um, but I do wine because my mom likes my my mom my sister like wine. Um, yeah, I don't know, beer, my my wife likes uh, IPAs. I can have, like, one IPA, but after that, it's just too citrusy for me. Um, but, yeah, no, that's me. Other than that, I don't really, jeez. Um, what else about me? Hard to tell right now. I don't really know, uh, uh, you know, currently COVID, everything's on lockdown and staying at home. I don't really, I don't really do much other than work and, research and cook uh, my favorite cuisine i'd have to say is um probably indian um well i mean i love i love food from all corners of the earth i think my favorite to cook is is indian um just because the the mingling of spices it's so it's, it's really creative the colors uh, a lot of the um the ingredients are so versatile and um you know that and there's a lot of uh, plant-based alternatives and before i was introduced to them i was like okay well you know vegetarian food i'm like mm, i would rather have a burger right but then i got introduced to things like pabaji i got introduced to dal uh all which are, are are really delicious and i you know through cooking these different dishes from indian cuisine i was like hey vegetarian food is actually really tasty and it doesn't have to be what i thought previously which was boring or i'd rather have something else so other than that i kind of like i also like um I like italian um because i'm a bit i'm kind of a carbo king i love pasta all kinds of every kind of pasta i love every kind of pasta sauce i also love um i like making uh, traditional carbonara I like making uh, sausage ragu. Those are usually my two go-tos. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions before we continue? Awesome. We There's a mango Indian dessert that I had once. Ring a bell. Um, hard to tell there is one there's one no that's an asian that's a chinese dessert i don't know like it could be lassi the only indian desserts i've really been exposed to is like gulab jamon and uh i think that's it actually yeah mango lassi i think so all right oh very cool i'll have to look that up Okay, so a little bit more about me, uh, contact information. So if you need to contact me at any time, just shoot me an email at david.cleary at georgebrown.ca. Okay. Um, I'm pretty, uh, I'm one of those, industry has kind of taught me that when I see something that needs to be done, I just do it. So if you email me, I'll probably get back to you within a couple of hours. But I do need to put in a little disclaimer here. Um, if I don't get back to you within a couple of hours, please allow 40, uh, 24 to 40 for a response, um, just because there could be something going on. I mean, there's lots going on right now with COVID-19. Um, so just in case there's some, some challenge that I'm experiencing, uh, just give me that uh, 24 to 48 hour window. Okay, but that said, I'm usually pretty good. Um, 
Emails after 5 p.m. will be responded to on the next day. Okay. Um, again, we all are working and learning from home for the most part. Um, and one of the challenges that I've experienced is that I have a hard time switching off work, Dave. So how I've learned to do that is by kind of not looking at emails after 5 p.m. That way I can go be <laughs> a husband to my wife. Um, and then emails on the weekend um, will be addressed on the next work day. Okay, so if, you, if that said, if there's a, a, a huge issue, um, I'll probably respond to you, like if it's an emergency situation. Um, if it's something that can wait till Monday, I'll likely just leave it till Monday. Okay, um, my office hours, um, I find it difficult to, to have a set window for office hours because um, it's hard for students to kind of drop in uh, from various courses, right? Because if I'm here on Collaborate in this course, other students can't come and see me. So I'm going to have kind of fluid office hours. So if you need to meet with me, I can meet with you. I'm working from home. Um, as long as you're free at a particular time that I'm free, we can sit down and have a chat. Okay, you just got to email me and let me know you'd like to have a like um, <clears throat> a quick conversation or, you know, you need some help or some practice with something. Uh, and then we can sit down on Teams or and collaborate and, and hash through it. Okay. Um, I send out weekly action plans and weekly recaps. So I check, uh, I send one out on Monday, kind of telling you what we're going to be talking about over the course of the week and giving you a heads up about any details or assignments that are due that week. And then I send out a recap at the end of the week, kind of just tying everything together. Okay. Uh, I think I covered everything here. Uh, does anybody have any questions about contacting me? Or put a, put a thumbs up in the chat if we're good to go. Right. Good. Very good. Continuing here. So our course objectives. I'm. I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly describe them. I'm not going to read them word for word. Um, so each one of these is a course learning objective. Is the contact listed in the course page? Yes, I believe it's listed in important course information. Good question, Ryan. Um, so here are course objectives. Okay. Um, each one is mapped to a specific program outcome. So uh, the same thing, but on a program level. So it kind of shows you how your course learning outcomes connect to the program ones. Uh, you're going to be able to, uh, the first one, you're going to be able to describe generally accepted accounting principles, okay, and apply them to various food service problems, okay. You're going to be able to describe the format and content of various special journals. Okay. You're going to be able to interpret governmental payroll tables to calculate somebody's net pay. You're going to plan and generate a set of accounting records for, in this case, it's going to be a, um, a single and multi-unit food service business. And then continued on the next slide is you're also going to be able to develop and design a trial balance um, using um, uh, various ledgers and journals. And then you're going to be able to do complete and design uh, various auxiliary, auxiliary um, accountancy documents okay, regarding details about inventories, receivables, and payables, and apply those to a food service case. Now, our weekly format, and this is actually a great slide to kind of end off on here. Um, we have two classes each week on Blackboard Collaborate. Okay, I sent out a link um, in my previous announcement. You can always get into our class using that link. Okay, the link won't change. Or you just go to collaborate on our Blackboard shell, click collaborate, and then click join the session, and then you'll you'll be in in the session. It's not like it's not like Teams where it's kind of weird. Um, so yeah, you can join uh, two ways. I'm going to give participants um, full access to the functionality of Blackboard Collaborate. So you'll be able to uh, draw on the screen if you want. Uh, please don't <laughs> right away. 
um, or use the text function for some activities that we're going to do, and I'll let you know when you can do that. Each one of our class is going to be three hours um, with two 15-minute breaks. Okay, usually I do it every 45 minutes, but we did go past it a little bit. Um, because I realize you probably have other things going on in your life because you are studying from home right now, and because that some um, some of the some material can be challenging. Okay, so it gives you a little bit of break <laughs> to take a breath, and because you know you can get up, go to the bathroom, uh, do whatever you want for 15, 15 minutes, put to put our course and Dave on hold. Okay, so um, just some time uh, to have a break. And then, um, generally speaking, before class, I, I kind of expect that you have reviewed the material posted to Blackboard. Uh, there's not much for this week. In subsequent weeks or subsequent classes, there are some videos that you can watch. Okay, so there's tutorial videos that I've, I've put up. Um, and those tutorial videos mimic the exercises we're actually going to complete in that class. Okay, so it's going to help you prepare for some of the things that we're going to practice uh, again in class, right? So if you look at the video, um, and I'm, I'm going through a tutorial, and I'm doing something, and you don't understand why, or uh, you'd like to ask a question about it, uh, if you've watched the video, you can come to class more informed and ask me those questions while I'm doing it, um, instead of being like, okay, well, he did that, but I don't know why. So it's good to watch the videos. And then our classes typically will be composed of lecture style instruction. Some, um, be, uh, it says group, but because there's only like, I forget how many students there are here, but there's not too many, probably just going to be doing exercises individually. That way I can give you immediate feedback on how well you're doing with that exercise and where your feedback is um, or your opportunities are so that you can improve for your assignments. Okay. Um, and then the textbook. I, I believe there's a textbook listed on the, the outline. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. You don't need it. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's not required, so you don't have to buy it. Um, but also because as long as you come to class, follow along, and participate, um, I'm, going to be the, I'm going to be right there with you. So I'm going to tell you whether you're, on, uh, you're in a good spot or if you're not uh, in the greatest of spots, what you need to do to be in a good spot. Okay. Um, in this course, we're talking about a lot of the accounting process, okay? And that process has been around since the beginning of Taylor's scientific management, which is back in like the early 1900s. So it doesn't really matter what a financial accounting textbook you have. It, the process is the protest, process. It will not change. And I'm very, very knowledgeable on that process. So. Um, please use me as your resource uh, for learning this content. Okay. Uh, again, there's also videos. Um, the PowerPoint slides are, are pretty detailed, um, and it have they have pictures and they have examples. Okay. Um, that's it. If you do feel that you need a textbook, uh, feel free to buy. It. Okay. And um, what else did I mention? I do record uh, all of my classes. Okay. Uh, and I will post them to Blackboard. Um, and the reason I do that is a because it's kind of common sense, but also because um, I understand that you good people are also learning from home as I'm working from home, right? I also understand that there may be some challenges in your life or some obligations that come before school, and there are there are some of them, right? And if if you're experiencing a challenge and you cannot make a class for whatever reason. OK, and you get to decide what that reason is or whether you get the idea, then you can, instead of coming to class, watch the video. OK, and then you can email me with any questions that you have. OK, so it by recording it, it does offer a certain level of flexibility for you in that if you have something else that you need to do and it's important to you, you can. OK, does that make sense, everybody? One thumbs up, one good, good. Yahtzee. Okay, good. Um, so let's, uh, did I have anything else to say on that point? 
Nope. Um, okay, so it's almost been an hour. Why don't we? Uh, how do you guys feel about a break? Do you guys want to take a break? Yes, no. How do you feel about a 15 minute break now? Cool. So we will take a, uh, a 15 minute break. Uh, I'm gonna go get a glass of water so my throat doesn't go uh, raspy. So we'll take a break and let's be back at uh, what would be 2, 2.12, okay? So let's uh, take a quick 15, uh, take, we'll be back at 2.12, and uh, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn off my mic, and uh, everybody have a good break. I'll see you in 15 minutes.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope everybody had a uh, had a good break and was able to get a glass of water or a little snack. Let's continue. So here are your evaluations in the course. Dun, dun, uh, you have, what is it? One, two, three, four, five. Five evaluations um, throughout the next seven weeks. Okay. You have uh, two assignments. Well, actually, you have three. Uh, your first assignment here is worth 20% of your overall, overall grade and is due at the end of week three. Okay, um, that's going to take you through the first uh, couple steps of the accounting process. So you're going to be giving a you're going to be given a list of transactions, and this might not mean a whole lot to you right now. I can appreciate that. Um, but uh, you're you're going to be given a list of uh, transactions. You're going to be asked to journalize them and put them into a ledger and take a trial balance. Okay. Uh, assignment number two builds off assignment number one and is due in week five, and it is also due 20% uh, of your overall grade. Assignment number two is going to take you through the remaining steps of the accounting process. So that's um, doing adjustments, adjusting entries, uh, closing entries, and producing financial statements. Okay. And again, in order to practice for those assignments, uh, we're going to be doing quite a few class exercises that will mimic a lot of the things that you will be completing uh, or doing in those two assignments. Okay. And you will also have class participation worth 10% of your overall grade and is ongoing. Okay. Um, the class participation, again, uh, we're going to be, you're going to be submitting some weekly classwork. So we're going to be doing exercises in class and you're going to be expected uh, to follow along or submit it at the end of the um, watch the video and submit it by the end of the week. OK. Um, and it's going to be worth 10 percent of your overall grade. And the reason I incl include participation is because it's so important to completing assignments one and two, but also for other course outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, the payroll outcome is assessed with uh, participation as well as um, the receivables, payables, and inventory uh, documents. Okay. Unfortunately, you do have a midterm. I'm sorry. Uh, that will be in week four. So, um, and it is worth 20% of your overall grade. It will be uh, primarily true and false and multiple choice based on course content, not necessarily on the, not on the textbook. It's based on course content. Um, and then you have your final assignment. You do not have an exam in this course. It's a final assignment, okay, uh, worth 30% of your overall grade. Uh, and that's due by the end of week seven, okay. Um, I haven't decided yet whether that's going to be a group or individual project uh, or a mix of both. Uh, stay tuned, okay. Oh. And your final assignment, um, it is going to ask you, uh, again, I told you that, that giving the question for your final exam is whether or not you would invest in a particular business given a set of financial statements, okay? Um, you're going to have to use all of the things that you've learned, excuse me, over the course of the oh. semester in order to make that particular decision and have it justified, okay? Um, the midterm will be... It will be open for, uh, it will be, we have two classes per week, right? It will be open for, it will be open on the Thursday after class, and it will stay open till the Sunday of that week. So you have roughly Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We've got four days to write your midterm. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about your, your evaluations or your assessments in the course? All good? Nope. We will continue. And here are our weekly topics. Okay, uh, I've put on the left-hand side the class. Uh, so classes 1 through 14, we have two classes per week. And the topic for each one of those classes. Okay. 
Um, I'm looking in here, and I think in order to give you more time for your midterm, I think I can combine class 9 and 10 into one class so that you have um, Thursday free from, from this course uh, to write your, your midterm. But uh, I'll keep interested on that. I just have to look at my material and uh, combine the two. Okay. So I'm not going to go through this uh, terribly extensively. Um, the first uh, one, two, first six classes, or so the first three weeks, takes us through the accounting process. So basically how to do accounting. Then class um, seven, eight, uh, seven, eight, the rest of the course is showing us how we would interpret various information that are also contained in financial reports. So, for example, um, uh, payroll, uh, balance sheets, income statements, um, documents referring to property, equipment, and inventories, as well as payables, receivables, and then a little bit of an introduction into corporate accounting. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about our weekly topics before we continue? And again, I'll, I'll remind you each week what topics we're going to be talking about um, in my announcements. No? Very good. So late policy. Yes, Mary Ellen, uh, to confirm the textbook is not necessary. Absolutely. All of your evaluations are based off of course material, not necessarily a textbook. So our late policy, late assignments will be deducted 10% per day. I'm sorry, but this is a management uh, degree. We do have to be professional in how we are submitting our work. Um, I think in industry, uh, uh, in industry every Monday, I'd have to produce a, um, a P&L and inventory numbers. Uh, sorry, a profit and loss statement and inventories, um, inventory numbers to my general manager and to my regional operations manager. And if I was late, even a day, they would be, they would be very not, they'd be very upset with me. So um, we do like to submit things on, on time. And if it's late, it will be deducted 10% per day. Late tests will not be accepted. Accepted. There's only um, there's only one test in this course, um, and you have um, quite a few days to write it. I think I misspoke when I said five days on the slide. You have a, 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 um, a, a four days, okay? Of course, there are exceptions to most rules in life, and we have some exceptions to these. Uh, and um, I will make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether uh, there are exceptions to be made. For example, um, if there's... Uh, if you or a family member comes down with a severe illness, okay, uh, then of course I can make an exception, okay. Uh, if there's, a, and I hope I'm going to knock on wood, that there is not a death in anybody's family. Um, and uh, in the event that the, uninfor the unfortunate event that there is, um, that is much more important than school. And we can, of course, make all of the exceptions in that case. Okay, but I really hope that doesn't happen. And then there are other compassionate grounds. Okay, and compassionate grounds is a blanket term for things like, um, I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe now because mental health is health. What I'm trying to say here is if you're, ha if you're struggling, uh, if there's something going on in your life that is taking away your attention from our course, keep me in the loop. Okay, because there are exceptions that I can make, there are extensions I can give, but you have to keep me in the loop. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, you know what I mean? Um, having to work the night that an assignment is due and not being able to submit it, that is not a, a compassionate ground and not a good reason to be submitting something late. Okay. Um, and in, on that note, uh, please be honest with me. I'll be honest with you every every time we, we communicate. Um, just keep me in the loop. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, no problem at all. I think that uh, if we've learned anything, I was teaching online before, so I had some experience in this. But 
Um, I think one of the benefits, if one of the benefits to doing uh, class online is that flexibility. And I think all of all academic institutions are really realizing that now. All right, so our health rules. Okay, so I'm going to start what I expect from you. Okay, so always be respectful to everybody. Okay, give everybody respect. Be honest, I've already mentioned it. Uh, and conduct yourself professionally. Okay, um, what I'm uh, essentially what I expect from you is what I would spec expect from you in industry. Okay, so being professional, being honest, and being respectful to everybody that's um, in the class and and me. And I, of course, I will. Uh, if that's what I'm expecting of you, I lead by example, and I don't ask anybody, whether it's my students or my my staff, to do anything that I do myself. Okay, so I will be respectful, I will be honest, and I will conduct myself in a professional manner. Okay, uh, what do you expect from me? Are there resources? Are there uh, things? Um, uh, what do you expect from me? Okay, and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, about our, our house rules, but uh, you know, is there a way that you learn best? Is there something that you would like included in the course? Yeah. What do you expect from me? Real life examples, totally. Uh, in every class, there will be real life examples. Absolutely. And understand why we do it this way and not that way. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Um, accounting is based on rules, and if you understand the rules, um, then you understand what to do, and on, as an extension of that, what not to do. And Danny, uh, announcements and weekly updates. Uh, yes, absolutely. I send out an announcement at the beginning of the week on Monday, and I'll send out an announcement on Friday at the end of the week. Uh, all of these announcements can be found on Blackboard, but I also uh, I also forward them to your your emails, okay? And they're not books. Um, they're they're I don't send you huge, huge announcements. It's just hey guys, this is what we're gonna be talking about during the week. This is let's do if there's something do and let me know if you have any questions. That's it. I really appreciate that all the slides are up on Blackboard and ready for to view. Super helpful. Yes. Um, they're already up. Most of the content is already up, uh, including some videos. I do have to go through and fix some of the videos because it looks like some of them aren't captioned. So I think there's one in week four that's not captioned and I have to download it and uh, upload it to YouTube and uh, have it captioned. Yes, absolutely. Um, that said, and I think I had mentioned this uh, to a student before, as one of the benefits of being in the degree program is it's much more academic, academically focused. And as reality changes, so an acad academia is based on essentially truth about reality, right? It's about knowledge, knowledge of reality or truth, right? Um, then there are different arguments about that, but we're not going to get into that. You might you might talk about that in your your research class, but you also might not. Um, as reality changes, we and as reality changes, knowledge changes, and I have to make sure that the knowledge that I'm presenting to you in this course is relevant and up to date. So in some cases, there might be slight changes to the content, but as I make those changes, I will let you know and I will post the those changes to Blackboard, okay? Um, just to keep everything relevant and, um, yeah, up to date. I think that's really important because um, because things do change, right? But the majority of the content that's on Blackboard largely 
will stay the same because it's based on your assessments. Okay. And lastly, under no circumstances, um, so just what did the process, the, uh, the pandemic affect the accounting process, no rules, no paperwork? Uh, how to ask this question. Did, okay, so what are the COVID implications into accounting in food service? Um, it didn't necessarily change the process because the process, the rules will always be the same. Uh, well, they change at some higher levels, but um, for the, our purposes, the process doesn't change. However, the implications of COVID have affected what our accounting statements look like. For example, um, yeah, um, obviously COVID-19 has been terrible to food service. It's been terrible to everybody, but there's been a lot of restaurants and food businesses that have closed down and, or, um, um, yeah, definitely higher costs in some areas, much lower sales, which have forced some business owners to close up shop. Um, there have been uh, businesses that have done really poorly in COVID-19, but there are others that have actually done pretty well. Um, we're actually looking into right now where we're putting together a case study um, that is looking into the successes, uh, a case study of success in COVID-19. And the point of my this research wouldn't necessarily to be like, hey, um, this restaurant did, uh, or this particular establishment did a great job and you should copy what they're doing. It's to kind of document some of the processes and what those successes were, right? Because when we talk about COVID-19, all we hear about is the, all the awful things, which is obvious, right? But um, we want to know what some of the successes were in, in food service. And they're very few and far between, but we found one restaurant that did really well um, not really well, but they, they managed to uh, be um, fairly successful and it was it was quick service. And from what I've started to get, gain an understanding of is that they financially performed well because their menu was super small and because they could execute that menu very, very, very quickly. Yeah, but that's, and that's that's what they did. They, they scrapped their menu. They scrapped their menu and they they built a menu for five items. Of course, they sold drinks and stuff like that, but they built their menu for five items, and all of those, most of those five items used all of the, used the same ingredients in just different ways. Uh, so they got very very creative. But yeah, and then lastly, and um, you're all very professional, and I can tell that you're all uh, respectful and you're conducting yourself very responsibly. Um, from our experiences so far or our interaction. Um, but I do have to say this, um, under no circumstances will there be any, well, I shouldn't say violence, but uh, bullying or discrimination in this course. Okay, so I expect all of the, the chats and your interactions with each other to be respectful and not to be bullying anybody or discriminatory in any fashion. Okay, um, an infraction like this would be, uh, uh, a student would be ejected from the class um, we would, and would be subject to um, academic disciplinary action, okay? But from my experiences, um, all George Brown students are professional and respectful, so uh, thank you for that. Academic integrity uh, was kind of a hot topic uh, recently. We found that uh, not necessarily within the degree program, just within like across all colleges and universities, um, that the switch online uh, made academic integrity a challenge. Um, academic in integrity is the general idea that when a student graduates, that they should be able to do at the very minimum, all of the, they should be able to satisfy at a very minimum, all the program learning outcomes for a particular designation, okay? It's also the idea that when you, and, and sorry, to accomplish that, all of your work needs to be your own work. So if you're, uh, you, all the papers that you write in this program and all of the work that you do in this program, 99% of it needs to be in your own words, okay? There are some, <laughs> there's some, there, there's not a whole lot of words in this course, it's mainly numbers, but your work and how you arrive at those numbers needs to be your own work, 
okay? If you are referring to the, a concept or an idea or work of others um, or a theory or something like that, you need to give credit to the author of that work, okay? Um, when you're referencing, um, please use APA style referencing, okay? Um, Purdue per OWL is a good um, is a good reference tool on how to do that. Uh, if you have questions about it, you probably won't be doing a whole lot of APA referencing in, in this course, but in your other courses. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. I've been, um, I've had referencing drilled into my brain <laughs> through my MBA and my PhD. And um, yeah, Microsoft Word does have a reference tool. I've seen there, I'm not sure, you can, a Google Scholar also has a good reference tool. So um, if you're searching up an article, uh, there's a little quotation mark underneath the article itself in Google Scholar. If you click that, it will give you an auto-generated reference for it, okay? If you're citing the ideas of others in the body of your own work, I'm not saying quotation, but if you're saying, you know, um, Dave's ideas were to do this, please use in-text citations. Okay, and again, uh, I believe the preference for the program is APA. Um, if your instructor has a different uh, preferred style, they'll probably let you know. Okay, and continue here. Um, while plagiarism, and plagiarism is, is again pre presenting the ideas of others as your own. Okay, that's a problem within academic integrity or concern. Cheating is another. Okay, cheating is loosely defined as working collaboratively when instructions were to work individually. Okay, in most of this course, the work that needs to be completed is going to be individual. For example, your first, uh, uh, your first two assignments, uh, your midterm and your participation are all individual. Okay, they should be your own work. You please do not work collaboratively. Okay. Um, I've taught this course five times now, and three out of those five times, I've caught cheating, okay? Um, I, I have a pretty keen eye, uh, but there's also self-assigned on, on, um, on Blackboard, okay? Um, and again, following all these rules just helps us, um, A, you get everything that you can out of the program, but also guarantee industry of your your prowess and uh, of uh, the material that we're talking about, okay? Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions about academic integrity? Good. All right, we will continue. Okay, so questions. Does anybody have uh, any questions about anything we've talked about so far? No? All right, very good. <clears throat> okay, so here is where I was going to do a bit of a, a Microsoft Excel tutorial. Now, when we use Excel in this course, we're not really using a whole lot of equations like we did in cost controls. Uh, we're just kind of entering information, okay? And based on the chat, most people had a good grasp of Excel, which is good. Um, so we're not going to cover it today, right? Um, but I do have a an Excel tutorial up on Blackboard if you do want a refresher, okay? And again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, that's about Excel. So lawyers versus accountants, okay? Um, Lawyers and accountants are, are very similar in a few different ways. Both are professionals. Both use generally accepted rules to understand their profession and to govern their actions and their professional practices. Lawyers and accountants are also concerned with facts opposed to personal opinion. 
However, within those rules, lawyers and accountants can be creative and look for loopholes. Okay, so while there are rules in accounting and in the law, um, in accounting, there are some rules that can be kind of bent a little bit. Okay, we will show you which ones can be bent a little bit, and we will show you which rules absolutely cannot. Okay. However, accountants are different from lawyers in one very specific way other than money. Okay. Lawyers investigate the, the impact of past events, while accountants investigate how current and past events can impact the future. Okay. And because of this ambiguous nature of the, the idea of the future, accountants often have to make assumptions about um, reality or about um, the future. So we have to make some financial assumptions. Financial assumptions are typically the way we believe systems, regulations, people and processes work and interact with each other without concrete evidence. Okay. These assumptions must be logical, and to the best of our ability, we need to make sure that our assumptions will represent reality. Okay, so they've got to be, in order to be useful, they have to be reflective of reality. Okay, because, and sometimes, um, if you're trying to make a decision, the information that you have will might get you to this point, okay, but you have a gap in the knowledge, okay. You have to bridge that knowledge with, a, with an assumption, a logical assumption, in order to continue with your decision-making process, okay? So in this class, you might not always know exactly what to do, and there's a – how am I going to say this without sounding silly? In this class, we present you with a set of finite rules. However, there may be a situation that exists outside of the guidance of those rules. You will have to, in some cases, make a decision about what to do in when the rules don't apply to a specific situation. Okay. Um, what would be an example here? I can't think of one right off the top of my head. But I'll let you know when you might have to make one. Okay. All right, so chapter one, getting into a little bit of chapter one here um, from the textbook, which you don't have to buy. We're going to talk about accounting as the basis for management decisions. We're also going to kind of, and in this chapter, we're going to describe uh, what accounting really is as a process and what kind of organizations use accounting. So again, we're going to define what accounting is. We're going to tell you, uh, and we already kind of have actually, uh, the different kinds of users of accounting information. We'll talk about the different types of accounting. We're going to talk about what organizations are. We're going to talk about what business transactions are. And we're going to talk about the different uh, forms of legal organization. And then we'll talk about accounting um, as an information system as well as financial statements. OK, um, today is 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 just um, quite a bit of de definitions. There's actually not too much. Um, and it's just some high level stuff. So what is accounting? Accounting is the language of business. OK. And it is a language in industry. I could look at a I could look at financial statements like an income statement and that income statement. I could interpret it and it could tell me not necessarily exactly what happened for a particular period of time, but it could tell me what the performance of the business, uh, the, it could tell me the business's performance over that particular uh, period of time. So it's a bit of a language. As a more formal definition, accounting is a system for collecting, summarizing, analyzing, and reporting information about an organization, okay? Um, and it's always in money. <laughs> in this course, we're going to be using a lot of numbers because we're talking about money, 
right? Now I'm trying. Um, yeah, and it's the language of business because activities. Do do do. I'm just going to write this down. Cool. Activities here. I'm a terrible speller. I apologize. The activities of a business, so that's the day-to-day -day ongoing. Uh, that's your staff doing their job. Uh, that's you doing your job. That's serving customers, things like that. Activities produce sales, right? For example, uh, if you're doing a catering event, uh, your activities and your staff's activities at that catering event produces the sales that you get from your customers. Uh, if you have a restaurant, um, you know, you have cooks that are cooking food, you have servers that are serving guests, and all of those activities produce sales, okay, from um, your, you know, uh, customers paying uh, for their dishes and their beverages. But the activities also consume resources. Okay. So when we're in a restaurant, when we're serving a guest, um, there's a cost to do that, right? Because our, the, lay, the, the, the cook, we have to pay the cook. Excuse me, we have to pay the server. Uh, the, the food that we're serving them has a cost to it. The, um, the utilities that we're using to cook the food has a cost to it. The beverages that we sell to them have a cost to it. So we have expenses or it consumes resources, right? And our sales and the consumption of resources in business can be expressed in money or in monetary terms. And that is why accounting is the language of a business because everything that happens in a business or most things that happen in a business can be boiled down to money, okay? Even activities. So accounting, again, we are collecting summarizing, analyzing, and reporting information about an organization in monetary terms because activities produce sales and consume resources, both of which, which, both of which can be quantified with money. So do we have any questions about my definition here around accounting? Okay. Good. All right. So here's here's a diagram that explains accounting uh, uh, the process a bit more. Okay. So accounting is a system of rules, of procedures, of um, yeah. So it's a system um, of collecting, summarizing reporting or sorry, analyze and reporting um, performance, um, business health in monetary terms. And the output of this accounting system or accounting is information or financial information about the organization. And usually that information comes in the form of financial statements. Okay, and the um, the uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But the, the three primary um, financial statements are called an income statement, which you're familiar with from uh, cost controls, a balance sheet, which might be new to you. Okay, a balance sheet um, gives us a general idea of a business's health, and then a cash flow statement, and a cash flow statement tells us um, where a company is generating cash or losing cash. Again, we'll talk a bit more about that in the subsequent slides. So who are the users of accounting information? I'm just going to put the other piece up here. Oh, I guess that was it. My apologies. Here are people who can use accounting information. Firstly, management is the prime user of accounting information because they need to know how their business is doing and if their business is not doing well they need to change some things in order to improve performance 
Uh, it's also management's job to have good business performance and be efficient with their resources. And financial statements tell them about that or accounting information tell them how well they're doing. But there are other people that use accounting information. For example, creditors, okay? Uh, creditors would want to know if, if they're going to give you credit of any kind, okay? Like a, uh, a loan, maybe. If they're going to give you a loan, they want to see your financial information so they can decide whether or not to give you that loan based on their, um, based on whether or not you can pay back that loan, right? For example, if if I came to you for a loan, let's say I came to you and I was like, hey, I want a million dollar loan and you had a million dollars to give me and I didn't have a job, you probably wouldn't give me that million dollars. So you'd wanna know my financial information, right? Investors uh, are also users of accounting information because in a similar way, if I'm investing in your business, I wanna know I'm gonna get my money back. I wanna know that I'm gonna get something from my investment, right? Employees, in some cases, use financial information. One example I have of that is, well, I have two, actually. Um, the first was when I was, earlier on in my career, I was, I was in a management position, and I found out that all of my servers made a lot more money than I did. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I should put my toe into, maybe I should try serving, because I'll make more money. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll work less hours. Keeping in mind, I was working full time and doing full time university. So <laughs> time was a, a limited resource. Um, so I started going around to restaurants. And when I was applying, I was like, hey, what's your average guest check, which is a piece of financial information. OK, it tells me on average how much each guest spends in a restaurant. OK, and then based on that average guest check. I can determine the average tip that one person would give me. And then based on that financial information, I can decide whether or not I want to work there because if I'm going to cut, if I'm going to quit my really stable job that I'm, you know, my really stable job, then I need to know that I'm going to make money somewhere else. So I needed to know that financial information. Um, other times um, I was, uh, there was one restaurant I applied as a general manager and uh I, my question um one of my questions to the owner was you know because uh, i knew the restaurant wasn't doing very well and i said well how long like i'm going to come in here and i'm going to help you fix the restaurant i need to know exactly how long you expect to stay in business and so i asked for his financial statements um and this never happens by the way they never give you the financial statements but i asked and he did if you don't ask you don't get um, and I looked at his financial statements and he was losing a lot of money week over week, month over month. And I decided it's best to not quit my job uh, where I had, uh, you know, a long term position uh, to take a general manager job only to lose my job uh, two months later because the business goes out of business. Right. Owners of businesses obviously want to see uh, financial information or accounting information from of their business because it could be at the end of the day that that's their money right profit um profit is the reward of being in business right it's risky to go into business it's risky to invest your life savings into a, a business uh start a business and because you risk that you get the rewards of that which is typically understood as profit so you'd want to understand where your money's going uh in some cases government wants to see your accounting information uh, we'll talk about different forms of organizations in a couple slides, but um, if you're a, a, a publicly traded corporation, um, A, you have to show your doc, your financial statements to everybody, but if uh, other types of corporations, the, company, uh, the government wants to see your financial statements because your taxes are determined by your financial statements, and taxes are the income or the revenue of the government. And then unions uh, want to see it sometimes. I don't really have any experiences or examples of unions, but unions are, they want to see, I don't know, maybe opportunities for better pay. They might want to see uh, where other, where resources are going or could be reallocated. I'm not sure.
Does anybody have any questions about the, uh, the, this big, this list of users of information, uh, accounting information? Fairly straightforward. We shall continue. So the types of accounting, and as an extension, the two main groups of accounting. Okay. First, we have external users of accounting information, and those are people or anyone that is, exists with outside uh, exists outside of the business. Okay. So on the previous slide, government, um, the government, investors, creditors, they use a business's accounting information, but they they they, use, they exist outside of the organization, right? So they would be an external user of accounting information. Um, however, there are internal users of accounting information, and those are the people that reside with inside the organization. So these are employees, these are directors, these are managers, right? Owners. Uh, and they are, because they're in, uh, inside of the business, they're considered to be internal, okay? Now, each of these users of accounting use the accounting system and the accounting process to generate financial statements and to understand them. However, um, there are different types of accounting, and each group of, uh, of users uses a different kind of accounting. For example, internal users of accounting information use managerial accounting, and that is a style or type of accounting that is focused on managerial decision making. It's about efficiency, it's about improving, it's about benchmarking, okay? Um, and then there is financial accounting, which is typically um, used by external users of accounting information. Financial accounting is um, is used by investors, creditors, things like that, where they look at financial statements uh, to make decisions, okay? And also by uh, financial accountants who actually create financial statements. So in some cases, for example, within corporations, when you're creating financial statements, your managerial accountant or your in-house accountant will create those statements, but an auditor or a third-party accountant has to come in and verify your financial statements. And that person would be um, someone who's using financial accounting. So it's much more about the technique of accounting than how accounting is used. For example, uh, managerial purposes, right? A little bit of a history um, lesson here. Um, right now, um, the accounting designation in Ontario, or even Canada, I believe it is, is called the CPA. And the CPA is a certified professional accountant. The certified professional accountant is both a managerial accountant, or they're educated in both managerial accounting as well as financial accounting. So they can sign off on those documents. Right, because before there was two separate designations. There was a CA, which was a certified accountant, which was a financial accountant who could sign off on a business's financial statements and say, I've audited the, these, they're true. And then there was uh, a CMA, which was a certified managerial accountant. And that managerial uh, accountant was educated in the ways of you know budgeting performance efficiency but we're not educated uh, in creating 100 percent perfect financial statements so their educations were different right um managerial accountants where while they were educated in slightly different ways they were educated in, fairly well in doing all the things that the financial accountants could do so um i don't know maybe a decade or two ago they merged the two um, financial designations into one, which again is the CPA or the Certified Professional Accountant. All right. Do, do, do. So organizations. So obviously organizations use accounting, have to, because that's how we communicate how the organization is doing. 
whether you are a for-profit business or a non-profit business or or non-profit organization. An organization is a group of, is a person or a group of people with a stated purpose, okay? An organization is a distinct, uh, distinct entity and it interacts in an environment with other organizations. If you look at the, um, uh, what is it called? If you look at the, the gears here on the screen, each one of these gears is a distinct entity, okay? It has a purpose, which is to turn or turn with the other in a specific way, um, but they work together to achieve their stated purpose, okay? Whatever that is. For example, um, if you own a food truck, you have that your organization, which is your food truck, is a distinct entity from your supplier, but you have to work with your supplier, which is an organization, in order to achieve your stated purpose, which is run a, a, um, a food truck. There are so many, and then um, within organizational thought uh, or organizational theory, there are so many different theories about how these gears should work, right? And that's where accounting was kind of born. So. In the beginning of organizational theory, there is a, um, and you actually, most of you have taken entrepreneurship, so you may be familiar with bureaucracy theory or the machine metaphor. And the bureaucracy theory or the machine metaphor is that every organization should run like a well oiled machine. Everybody has their job, everybody knows what to do, um, everything, everything can be broken down, measured, analyzed, and uh, quantified. This was largely based off of uh, Max Weber's work. Okay, he was the one that kind of generated bureaucracy theory. And there was a ooh, William Taylor, I forget his name, but uh, a, a scholar named Taylor created what we now know as scientific management. And the foundation to scientific management was accounting because we can boil everything down to numbers or money and to better understand our organization and make it more efficient and make decisions. Um, what else would I say here? There, and that is pretty much the bureaucracy theory or the machine metaphor is the basis to pretty much every BCom program there is. We obviously talk about sustainability, so we include some stakeholder theory and corporate social responsibility, things like that. But um, the main premise to BCom programs is that bureaucracy theory. Now, while bureaucracy theory has been heavily criticized since its creation, bureaucratic organizations have weathered the time of change or over the years because everything is standardized and everything is measured and <clears throat> um, because we use accounting. I mean, other, other forms of organization can use accounting, of course, but um yeah uh or bureaucratic organizations uh, tend to be a the most successful right now and uh, the most uh, frequent form of organization so business transactions business transactions are <laughs> uh exactly like a personal transaction except between um business to business okay business to business in a lot of case, or B to C, okay? Um, but what is a business transaction, okay? It's an interaction between two organizations or uh, your customer group. It's an equal exchange of value. So I give you this, you give me that. Um, it represents value given versus value received, or that services, um, services or products are given and you are given payment, right? So um, a tra what did I, a transaction from a, a personal example of your of a of a transaction, would you be going would you be going you going to Tim Hortons and buying a coffee? What is the value you are giving Tim to Tim Hortons in that example? You're buying a coffee. So you go to Tim Hortons. What is a double double nowadays? Yeah, thank you, Mary Ellen's money. Two bucks. Yeah. 
So you go, you pay a double double, you give customer spending exactly. So you end money, yeah. So you you go, you buy a uh, Tim Hortons double double, you give them two dollars, and then they give you what you uh, a, a double double, which uh, assumes the value of two dollars. So value equal uh, given equals value received. A business example. Uh, of a business transaction, which are the fundamental uh, fundamental building block of accounting oh. information, is you buying um, ingredients from a supplier. Okay, you give your supplier money, and they give you your ingredients for your inventory. On the other, and that's an example of a business to business transaction. There are also business to customer transactions, where you make food. And you sell it to a customer for money. So value is given uh, and value is received. And these are understood as business transactions. And at most of the time, when there is a, uh, a business transaction, either B2B or B2C, there is something that we call a source document. A source document is a document that proves that that transaction happened or occurred. Source documents can come in the form of invoices. Okay. Um, invoices for B2B transactions or customer bills in B2C transactions. Both of these examples prove that a transaction has happened and value has been given and value has been received. Does anybody have any questions about what business transactions are? Was that was that fairly clear? Okay. All right, we'll keep going here. Okay, so legal forms of organization. So these are the types of organizations that use accounting, and they all use accounting. Uh, first, we have sole proprietorships, we have partnerships, and we have corporations. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, I, this is just a list. I'm gonna go in the next couple of slides. I'm gonna go into um, the different. Um, uh, the more specific differences of these organizations. First, we have sole proprietorships, and so, uh, sole proprietorships are businesses that have only one owner. There is no sharing of profits, so whatever money you make, uh, it's or whatever profit you make is the profit of the owner. They're very simple to set up. Okay, so you you go on to uh, you go on to you can go on the, the BDC website. You can go on to the um, the Ontario website. You get a um, you register your sole proprietorship. You spend a hundred dollars to uh, to get a, an HST number. You spend another hundred dollars to do a name check for your business, and then you are the owner of a sole proprietorship. Super easy. Um, while all of the profits that you make are yours as the sole proprietor of the proprietorship, um, there are questions around taxation. Typically speaking, yes, you get all the profits from your business. Um, how, those profits are technically income for the owner, and those profits are taxed at the personal income tax rate, so not the corporate rate. Uh, uh, sole proprietorships have a limited life. Okay, so it, uh, the sole proprietor, uh, sole proprietorships are limited to the life of the owner. When the owner of the sole proprietorship passes, uh, the, um, the the so does the sole pro, uh, so does the business, unless it is willed to somebody else. Um, yeah. And there's a major downfall to sole proprietorships is there is unlimited liability. Okay, in other forms of organization, you are, you as the owner of a sole proprietorship are protected from the business's liability. However, in a sole proprietorship, you have unlimited liability. 
So if someone is suing your sole proprietorship or your business, yes, they are suing your business, but they're also suing you and you are liable for the damages of your business. Is anybody, uh, and the major advantages here is uh, they're super easy to start. There's only one, uh, one owner and can be fairly simple um, to do your taxes. It's fairly straightforward. The major uh, limitation uh, within sole proprietorships are the unlimited liability. On the other hand, we have partnerships, very similar to uh, sole proprietors. Uh, so proprietorships, sorry, in that they're easy to set up. Okay, uh, an advantage is, uh, an advantage of partnerships is that uh, because there's multiple people coming into a partnership, there is a combination of capital coming into the business or money, and there's also a combination of experience and expertise that can run the business. There are also uh, questions of taxation within partnerships because the um uh because the partners if they're not equal the amount of profit that they get is based on the uh, amount of the business or the partnership that they own which is based on how much money they put in which is taxed at the personal income tax level um they have a limited life um in some cases they have unlimited liability in other cases, there's what well, we have uh, LLPs, which is called a limited liability partnership. But for the most part, they're um, um, un uh, unlimited liability. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's getting super dry. Um, and uh, I believe in the cases where it's limited liability, you have to be part of a professional association. Uh, for example, uh, accountants and lawyers typically start limited liability partnerships to protect themselves from the liabilities of the business. And then there's uh, the idea of mutual agency, um, which is both a blessing and uh, <laughs> uh, blessing and a hindrance, or can be. Mutual agency is the idea that there are multiple people working within the business, and you're all working towards a mutual goal, right? However, there's something that's called the, uh, the agency problem, right? And that's the idea that in some cases, partners within a partnership won't work towards the same goal and they will have separate goals. So the business is going in two different directions. Um, one example I have uh, of the, the an agency problem within a partnership is um, my one of my friends was a uh was a general uh, was an owner slash general manager of a nightclub in mississauga i forget which one it was and uh he quit and the reason he quit is that he wanted to take the nightclub which was also kind of like a it wasn't a, um you could eat food at this nightclub like it was kind of a fancy lounge if you will um he wanted to take the menu and that kind of the style of this lounge in a different direction than the other partner. The partner wanted to like get rid of the food and just make it 100% booze and make it a nightclub. Whereas uh, my friend wanted it to be more of a lounge where people could enjoy high uh, high end cocktails and beverages, but also eat uh, casual fine dining food, right? So they weren't working together really. They weren't working towards the same goal. Uh, my um, they ended up buying my friend out. So he he went other ways um, and if you've ever heard of you've ever asked somebody um, you know uh, if one of your friends say hey I quit and they were an owner of something or a partner and you say why did you quit and they said because of creative differences in quotes like finger quotes uh, that's usually it's pretty in, uh, indicative that there was an agency problem we also have corporations okay um, Yes, the taxation for partnerships. Um, in some cases, they can be taxed at the income, uh, sorry, the personal, it depends on the form of the partnership, but they can be taxed at the personal income tax level, depending on uh, how much profit they're making, which is dependent upon how much of that partnership they own. 
for example, uh, Mary Ellen, if you and I were to go into a partnership and uh, we're going to start a partnership, you're going to put in $50,000 and I'm going to put in $10,000 to start this partnership, you would get more profit and you would be taxed differently because you own more of the partnership. Does that make sense? Awesome. Um, so other or uh, forms of organizations are corporations, um, fairly typical nowadays. Okay, anybody, if you're over, I believe, the age of 18, you can own a corporation. Uh, however, they are expensive. Yes, Vanessa, that's correct. Um, corporations are fairly expensive to start up because you need lawyers, because you're incorporating. Um, corporations are extremely different between... Uh, are very different from partnerships and sole proprietors. You can own a sole proprietor or a par and a partnership, and those two businesses, uh, the entity is the same as you. For example, if you're if you're the owner of a sole proprietorship, there is no difference between you and the business, and that's why you're taxed at the business is taxed at your personal income tax rate. Well, actually, you are. Um, Corporations, however, a corporation is a, dis a distinct entity from the owner. Okay, so if I were to go start up a corporation, ABC Company, ABC Company is a completely different financial entity than myself. Okay, because it is 100% uh, um, distinct entity from myself as the owner, as an owner, I have limited liability. So basically, if someone sues my corporation, my corporation is being sued, not me as an owner, right? So let's say I, um, an example I have from industry um, is that my owner, one of the owners I worked with, uh, he, he incorporated his restaurant. So his restaurants were incorporated. And there was um, one of the bartenders overserved a, a patron one night. And in restaurants, when you overserve customers, which is bad, and the bartender should not have done that, you are legal, legal, legally liable to make sure that that customer gets home okay. And if they don't, any damages that occur, the restaurant can be liable, right? Um, so this person um, was got overserved, walked outside, um, what is it, got in his car and drove home which is obviously drinking and driving, and that's against the law. So he got pulled over, he got a DUI, uh, got put in jail and stuff like that, lost his car, and then he sued uh, the restaurant um, because it was our fault that he got a DUI. <laughs> uh, we, again, we should not have overserved him, but I mean, uh, his lawsuit was that we, it was our fault that he got a DUI. Um, and if my and he he won <laughs> he he sued we um i forget how much he sued for i don't even think that the owner told me but when i was talking to the owner about it i was like aren't you worried man they're gonna like they might like take your house and stuff like that and he was like no it's a corporation he's like, I'm, 100, I'm i'm protected here like yeah it's gonna take a chunk out of my cash from the business but i'm not i'm not personally liable for this so corporations uh, can have an advantage there where you're not financially liable for um, the ongoings of the business. Um, corporations can be owned by many people, and because a corporation is owned by many people, it has an unlimited life. Okay, it's super easy to transfer ownership. Um, um, my experiences with that is um, I. My dad owned a corporation, and he needed to he needed to pass it off to me really quick for financial reasons. Um, so, and doing that, all I had to do was sign uh, my articles of incorporation, and I owned the corporation. On the other hand, uh, you've heard of the stock market. Um, you buy shares of a company on the stock market, and a share of a company is a piece of ownership of that company. Uh, stocks are traded all the time um, in great volume, um, and because it's and because they're trading ownership, uh, it's super easy to transfer that ownership. 
Corporation, corporations also have easy access to uh, capital, so expansion money, because they can be publicly traded. Corporations are taxed uh, two times, unfortunately, uh, or you as the owner of a corporation are taxed two times. One, the income of the corporation is taxed once, because we all pay we all pay tax on our business income or business profit. And then if you pay yourself out a dividend, which is taking money out of a corporation or profit out of a corporation, you're taxed again uh, through capital gains. So you get taxed two times. And there's a lot more government control for corporations. For example, you have to produce financial statements for the government every year, in fact, every quarter. Now, <clears throat> despite, um, just let me see what slides next here. I just want to check something out before I do that. Okay. So in terms of, you know, what kind of, what form of organization should I use for my business, right? They all use accounting. Uh, sole proprietorships might use a different kind of accounting called the cash basis of accounting. They might. Uh, but the rest, so partnerships and corporations usually use what we use, uh, what we call accrual accounting, uh, which we'll talk about next week. So we don't, we don't have to put a definition around it just yet. But which uh, corporation would be, uh, sorry, which form of organization would be more advantageous to you? Like if you're starting a business, which one should I, which one should I choose? It depends on the context, right? If you're starting up a business like, uh, you know, a medium to large size business uh, with many employees, um, you know, a restaurant, for example, I would say go corporation 100 percent. OK, it is expensive to start up, but the liability uh, is good. Um, what is it called? Um, it has an unlimited life. Um, it helps protect you from the financial obligations of your business. Okay. On the other hand, if you are, um, you could all, you could also open up a partnership. Okay. Um, if you and another wanted to open up a restaurant, you could do a partnership, but you would want to make sure that there's limited liability. However, if you're looking to open up catering or you're looking up to looking to make, um, you know, some sort of quick little food service, um, maybe a sole proprietorship would work well for you. Um, I knew a lady, uh, she made pierogies out of her kitchen and she sold them uh, and she just had a sole proprietorship. There was no, no reason to have a corporation and there was no reason to have a partnership because it was only her, right? So she just, she had a sole proprietorship. Um, my mom does uh, receivables management for different companies uh, and it's just a corporation. Like she, uh, sorry, it's just a sole proprietorship. Because there's no point. There's no point in going through. There's no liability. There's no point in spending the extra money to set it up. Uh, she doesn't have a partner. So it's easy just to keep it as a sole proprietorship. Uh, most catering that's done on the side um, are, are sole proprietorships. Uh, for example, my mom buys uh, fancy cookies for, fa for special events. Um, the lady that she goes to see is a sole proprietor. Uh, regarding the taxes, sorry, um, yes, so um, sole proprietors and partnerships use, um, the tax rate is your personal tax rate, however, corporations is a corporate tax rate, and if you declare dividends, the owner is taxed again um based on a uh, capital gains rate does that help vanessa awesome okay so accounting as an information system. Again, all organizations use accounting as an information system. We use um, 
and this information system is a, is a bit of a it's a bit of a machine, if you will. Okay, there's an input to the machine, there's a, a process, and there's an output. Okay, the input to the accounting machine is business transactions as shown in source documents that prove that a transaction has uh, has happened. We use we then use the accounting cycle which is what we're going to be covering in the next uh, three weeks or so. We use the accounting cy uh, cycle and process to turn those inputs into an output, which is information to management or other users in the form of financial statements. So financial statements give us an indication of performance as an extension of that efficiency. Uh, of business health and um, and uh, and cash position or where your money's coming from and where it's gone. Okay, and these financial statements, more specifically, are the balance sheet, the income statement, which you already should be fairly familiar with from uh, cost controls and the statement of cash flow or very simply the cash flow statement, okay? The balance sheet tells us about business health. The income statement tells us about uh, business performance or financial performance, I should say. And the statement of cash flow tells us about where money has come from and where it's gone and essentially the changes to our cash position. Okay, so maybe um, because I wanted to keep this, uh, this class fairly short, because I understand it's the first, I don't want to overwhelm anybody, uh, we're probably going to close off um, uh, class here. So we'll give you the last half an hour off. Um, We'll take this piece up next week at the beginning of class, okay? So based on this week's material, over, you know, the next, over the week or uh, between now and next class, think about what form of business or corporation a restaurant should take and why. Like, should it take the form of a sole proprietorship? Should it take the form of a partnership? Should it take the form of a corporation and why? Oh, we are meeting on Thursday. Sorry, sorry, sorry um and next uh and why so what's your justification why do you think a restaurant should take that form of organization okay so why and then um yeah so think about that between now and thursday thank you vanessa <laughs> and um and we'll talk about it in on, on thursday at the beginning of class okay and before our next class uh try to familiarize our yourself with our blackboard page I tried to keep it fairly minimalistic, okay? Um, for example, in our important course information, that's my contact information, your course outline, things like that. Uh, your assessments tab contain all of your assignments and your tests. Your weekly learning materials contain just that. Every, uh, it contains every class from week one, uh, class one to 14. It contains PowerPoints, videos, and other resources, okay? And then come to class ready to discuss your ideas around um, the form of organization and then review the Excel tutorial if you have not already or if you need a bit of a refresher. Okay, how does that sound everybody? How are you feeling? Pretty good, good, great, awesome, good. Good. So unless there are no other questions, um, great first class. Everyone did a great job, great effort. And um, uh, yeah, we'll see everybody at uh, one o'clock on Thursday. Have a great day, everybody.